everyone welcome back to science talk show presented by times of biotech today we have with us professor rodolfo albano whose specialty lies in working on multidisciplinary scientific research so let's welcome professor albano hello professor welcome to the show thank you very much and i was very happy to be invited for you uh, by you uh, to participate in your show thank you we are happy to have you on this show, sir. Today, I'm curiously want to know about your multidisciplinary approach to scientific research. Can you briefly explain about it? Sure. I'm not sure I can do it briefly, but uh, well, I started my uh, my uh, studies in biology as an undergraduate uh, student in Brazil, and it's very common there uh, to enter uh, at a lab as an intern from early on. So in my first year, I was an intern in the biochemistry department. Well, biochemistry mm -hmm. itself is quite multidisciplinary because there are many fields uh, within biochemistry. There's physical biochemistry. There's uh, in, you study enzymes or you can study uh, reactions and things like that. Anyway, so I, I started working on carbohydrate chemistry, which okay. involves organic chemistry, which involves uh, biochemical techniques, spectroscopy, uh, chromatography. So it was a multidisciplinary field. So I, after I finished my master's degree, uh, I went to London to do a PhD in developmental biology, another multidisciplinary field, because you, you study anatomy, you do histology, uh, molecular biology, and again, biochemistry to study how embryos develop from one egg to a multicellular uh, organism. So when I went back to Brazil, uh, developmental biology was a, a bit difficult to uh, work in Brazil because it was very competitive internationally. Uh, you needed a lot of uh, resources and uh, there, there weren't many people that were working on developmental biology at that time. But since I had uh, learned a lot of molecular biology techniques in my PhD, I started uh, trying to work with people that uh, needed uh, molecular bio biological solutions. A lot of people uh, were not really accustomed to molecular biology techniques in Brazil. So I started collaborating with them. And mm -hmm. of course I had my own scientific interests, but then the collaborations went so well that I started working on several uh, you know, subjects. I worked on cancer, I worked on uh, um, bacteria, I worked on metagenomics and mm -hmm. it was fun. It was, I, it was great to interact with other uh, researchers uh, both students and PIs, you know, uh, uh, principal investigators, to come to a common uh, resolution of scientific questions. So that's how I got involved into, into a multidisciplinary uh, research. Um, sometimes it's detri it was detrimental to my career because oh. we publish, academia is uh, mainly a, 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 an area that uh, you are measured by your, you know, publishing papers. And yes. at the time that I started, uh, you know, publishing papers and everything, it was not very common to have more than one uh, principal author. Uh, nowadays, it's quite common because people are more multidisciplinary now. Uh, the uh, multidisciplinary work actually in science is became, becoming more and more important because uh, institutes are joining up their different uh, specialties. Uh, and so, of course, if you have three or four PIs, not everybody can be, not just one person can be the, you know, the main uh, corresponding author. So now people are sharing more. But throughout my career, that was a, a main uh, problem for me because uh, even though, you know, we all contribute equally, uh, it was not always recognized by the publishing, uh, you know, entities, mm -hmm. the journals and everything. But that's okay. You know, that's, uh, I had fun. Uh, I did science and that was my main interest. Although, sir, when uh, you studied into multidisciplinary areas, uh, it was not that common. But as you said, now the common to have a diff uh, people working together from the different sector. Based on your experience on studying in diverse field, do you recommend other fall? Uh, other people to study uh, to follow this uh, same education pattern if yes then how it's going to be beneficial to them well uh i would if i had to look back i wouldn't change what i did uh, mm -hmm. although like i said you know it was sometimes uh, people would say oh you don't have a 
you don't have your own line of work you don't have your own you know area uh or whatever you're not an expert in just one area and mm -hmm. i don't think that we should uh, listen to these kind of comments i think that uh first of all science has to be interesting for those who yeah. are doing it otherwise you will not be able to do it you, you can't do science in a bureaucratic you know in a boring way so you have to be excited you have to be intrigued and you know, if you work in different fields, you're always getting feedback from people because maybe you didn't you didn't uh, study things with the same approach as the other person. So this other person will give you another view, and together, you know, you, you have meetings with them, you discuss science with them. So I recommend that if you are interested in different areas of science, you should not limit yourself to just one of them, because nowadays. Uh, it's impossible because if you want to study something deeper, you need different, as I mean, for example, let's take cancer, for example, like you, uh, it's one of the areas that I studied. You need people that do electron microscopy. You, do, you need people that do biochemistry. You need people that do histology. You need people that uh, are clini clinicians that, you know, treat the patients. You need pathologists. So it's a multidisciplinary area because it's a complex disease. I mean, most things that we study now are complex. Mm, yeah. You know, there are systems that are very uh, in, uh, full of details and, and, and with a lot of uh, uh, different aspects. So, you know, how can you one, just one person dominate everything? So I recommend yeah. that people do the multidisciplinary work. Uh, they, they should find somewhere, uh, an institute or university that values this and follow this area because this is the future, you know, and, and you should uh, pursue your interests. Of course, I mean, not everybody's gonna be interested in organic chemistry or material science, uh, you know, but you have to follow uh, the areas that you are interested in and not limit yourself to those areas. You have to find, uh, of course, techniques are important and everything you should learn, but, you know, read, read from other areas read from different kinds of, uh, of, of articles, papers, mm -hmm. you know, don't limit yourself to, I mean, I used to read a lot. I used to go to the library a lot, you know, uh, nowadays it's so easy. You can just, you know, I had to take a bus to go to another university to, you know, look at their library and look at the papers that were a month or two months old. I mean, nowadays you have everything in, at the click of a you know, finger. So, Fingers. you know, you should yeah. read. That's, that's right. You should read. You should inform yourself. You should find the things that uh, make you, you know, happy. Mm -hmm. Mainly, you should be happy working. Uh, science has to be, you have to be a, a happy person doing it. You have to be, it has to be fun because it's a very hard sometimes because you, you deal with failure a lot. Yeah. You know, experiments don't work or your project doesn't go as well as you think. But then, you know, if you're in a multidisciplinary field, somebody from another field can actually help you, you know, with your questions. So I recommend that people talk to each other, uh, collaborate, because in this way, you can have a broad view of science and you can start integrating things. Because sometimes if you only do one type of work, it's very hard to have a, the picture of the whole picture. So multidisciplinary uh, research actually helps you to have a glimpse of the whole picture. I think that, it, that it's very much need, required that you should work interdisciplinary because although an engineer invents a machine, it is invented for a biological person. So he should know the biological parameters to work on. So it's quite needed. But sir, one more thing I would like to know is what's the most important thing where which helps you to manage all this integrated research and your collaboration with other experts well first of all you have to enjoy uh being with your collaborators uh and you have to have meetings you know you have to have regular meetings and usually i interact with with, with the pis with the main uh, principal investigators and with their students so we sit down, we talk, we discuss mm -hmm. science, we have regular meetings. Otherwise things get, you know, too out of hand because you have, especially because I, as I have uh, several collaborators, it would be very hard to uh, follow everything that's going on without uh, talking to them. So this pandemic also, you know, puts a burden on this. 
uh, it's it's harder to do that uh, and you know uh, remotely. But as most of the work was being done uh, before that, you know, so we would have regular meetings and discuss you know the science. Uh, I, I'm a very hands-on person. I like to be in the lab, so I usually am in the lab with the students. So mm -hmm. I help them out with their technical difficulties and, and theoretical difficulties. Uh, so, you know, being interactive, being there for them, not being, you know, if you're a very busy person and, you know, you, you cannot uh, take your time to talk to people and, and help them in the bench if they need, then this will be hard for you to collaborate and have a multidisciplinary kind of, a, unless you delegate to somebody, but that, you know that's not what I usually like to do. I like to participate actively in both the lab work and also in the you know theoretical part of the of the of the science as well. Indeed. So you have to be an open person. You have to enjoy uh, yeah. you know yeah. being with people. Yeah, indeed, sir. Moving on to the your areas of work. Mm -hmm. I know you work on cancer and as well as antimicrobial resistance. And as I know, the cancer is a burden on each country. However, another silently emerging burden is antimicrobial resistance. So what is your take on solving these problems? Well, I think both of these problems are uh, uh, public health issues. Mm -hmm. Because although, of course, cancer uh, can be... Uh, can happen sporadically. I mean, you can have a sporadic mutation. Most cancers are due to, uh, you know, habits that are not healthy, like drinking too much, smoking, uh, obesity, which is related to eating too much, overeating and not doing enough exercise. So these things, uh, you have to um, actually educate people. Okay. Because nowadays, uh, if, if you don't have a, a, a good mind and take care of your body, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult because you, you're going to have uh, some type of disease later on. It's either diabetes or cancer, which are uh, very uh, complex diseases. So uh, if you take uh, cancer as a, as a public health issue, uh, mm -hmm. the main thing is to prevent an early diagnosis. So prevention is related to education. So you have to yeah. educate people of not to take risk factors. Governments also have to legislate because, uh, of course, pollutants uh, that, you know, it's not my choice to breathe uh, a polluted air or to consume polluted uh, foods. So governments yeah. have to take uh, action to regulate, you know, these products and um, prevent people from ingesting them and eating them or, or being exposed to them. Mm -hmm. And the early diagnosis, actually we are, we are coming to a, a very exciting age because uh, now with the next generation sequencing, we have the power uh, to diagnose cancers very early on. So this technology has to be you know, spread and has to be uh, democratized to everyone. You know, it has to be uh, uh, spread out. So nowadays we have liquid biopsy. There are several products that are coming up there that can uh, diagnose, do an early diagnosis from plasma. You know, people, you, you, you draw your blood by a mm -hmm. professional, uh, he will draw your blood. And then we take the circulating tumor DNA that can be deeply sequenced. And then you can find mutations from even minute tumors that are you know, uh, appearing on your body. So the early diagnosis is very important because of course there are techniques that are, uh, are being developed in medicines to treat cancers. But if you're treating a mid to late stage cancer, mm -hmm. it's very complex because this tumor has stem cells, it has a microenvironment that it has influenced other cells, it has hundreds maybe thousands of mutations. Of course, some are more important than others. There are driver mutations, but still, you know, it, it becomes very hard. So if you, if you can early diagnose cancer, and now we have the technology to do that, you know, mm -hmm. so governments should also take action towards uh, 
improving and, and making early diagnosis more accessible to everyone. And also educate people on, you know, to prevent them from uh, acquiring these habits that are detrimental to their bodies. This is the hardest part, I think, <laughs> because uh, people don't want to change much. But anyway, I mean, we're I mean, we, we seeing this with vaccination and all that. So anyway. So now the, the other part that you asked me is uh, antimicrobial My resistance. Resistance. That's yeah. another. Yeah, actually, I saw one of your articles on LinkedIn as well from you guys who had one article about that. That was very good. I think Thank it's, you, uh, it's a big concern. Uh, we have to think about it because uh, for more than a decade, we haven't had new classes of, anti of, of antimicrobials being developed. Yeah. And, you know, why is that? Because there's not much money involved in that. And of mm -hmm. course, I mean, I'm not criticizing here companies and, and the industry or, at all, but I also understand that in, industries have their own priorities. They have their, their agendas and everything. So, you know, they have their... They have to invest in, in several different areas because there are different diseases and all that. Yeah. But anyway, we desperately need new anti uh, antimicrobials. Why? Because bacteria have been fighting against each other or competing, I should say better, for, you know, in the environment, for different niches, for, uh, you know, for different uh, nutrients. So they are used to uh, become resistant to, the, to other bacteria. So this is in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in it is a, a property that's uh, uh, it's you know it's, it's their own uh, way of behaving. Yeah. So they know how to evade drugs. They know how to evade uh, antimicrobials because these antimicrobials come from fungi, from other bacteria. So you know they know how to evade that. So it takes uh, very little time for them uh, to be exposed to an antibody. To, sorry, to an antimicrobial, and then some kind of resistance develop because there are so so many different mechanisms that can become uh, mm -hmm. that, that can make a bacterium uh, resistant to that drug. You know that uh, eventually one or a, a percentage of that population will become resistant, and if they are continually continually exposed to that uh, antimicrobial, then you know resistance will, will will be established. So. Like you said in your article, nowadays we use too many anti antimicrobials. Antimicrobials are spread in, in the environment. They're, they come from farms. They come from uh, actually even soaps that we use. Uh, you know, Exactly. They are spread everywhere. So, you know, and a lot of bacteria are using them as carbon sources to grow. <laughs> so, you know... Uh, yeah, and a lot of the, a lot of yeah, a lot of the bacteria that cause problems to us are opportunistic pathogens. Yeah. What does that mean? That means that we acquire them from the environment. So they are environmental bacteria that are used to be exposed to a lot of different compounds. So they they have a lot of uh, metabolic flexibility. So you know we have to. Uh, so this is a public health issue. So we have to control the use of antimicrobials. We have to limit their use. We have to invest money because mm -hmm. millions and millions of people will die in the next decade from you know, antibiotic resistance, especially now with COVID. There are so many people that are in um, ICU units, yeah. intensive care units, that uh, you know, they are acquiring. Worse. They are acquiring nosocomial infections. They are acquiring hospital infections from bacteria. And sometimes, and there are genes and there are uh, genetic elements that are spreading resistance that will make you resistant to most anti antimicrobials. You know, and, and if you need next generation anti antimicrobials, these are very expensive, you know? Yeah. So uh, governments should also uh, take action and sponsor perhaps the research in companies as well because companies do this very well. Nowadays we have machine learning, uh, artificial in intelligence. We can maybe modify uh, you know, antibodies that already exist, uh, try to create other ones, but by you know, studying the metabolic uh, uh, pathways using biochemistry and 
molecular biology, you know, to, to try to develop new drugs. Because if we don't do it now, we're going to have to race after that once it becomes yeah. established. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, we should be educated in all, all kinds of aspects in, in, in this problem. So it's both a public health issue where we have to, to educate the public on antibiotic uh, usage. And also we have to have uh, special programs to develop new drugs. Otherwise, uh, this is going to be very hard. To manage. So far from your talk, I have understand that you are working in a complex network, complex mm -hmm. network of interdisciplinary studies. So mm -hmm. my lastly, I would like to ask the important questions related to students. How do you, on what basis you select your students for PhD under you? Well, uh, usually the students come from, uh, you know, the courses that we teach and also from different uh, collaborators, because a lot of times I'm a co-supervisor as well, because uh, that student will have, we need some of my skills. And so I, I help them in their thesis and we join uh, supervision. A lot of times there, there are interns that come to the lab uh, and they get interested in our research and then they, they continue throughout the, uh, their undergraduate courses. And then they, uh, when they finish, they say, oh, okay, I want to do a master's degree or a PhD. So we have this culture here in Brazil that uh, people actually go to the labs and try to find the, because we don't understand that only from theoretical, uh, you know, classes from just from lectures, you, you, you don't have a really good professional training. Mm -hmm. So they get that from being interns. So either from interns that come to the lab or from collaborators that uh, share students and then maybe this student will do a master's degree with, with one collaborator and then maybe he wants to do a PhD with me. So there's a lot of uh, lateral movement <laughs> of the yeah. student, which is nice because we, you know, it's, it's a very uh, uh, dynamic environment. I was also, I was uh, for like 10 years, I was a, a vice uh, director of our uh, graduate program. So mm -hmm. I interviewed a lot, lots of students for all these years for the for the masters and the PhD programs. So some of them did PhDs with me as well. So you know it's a very dynamic uh, environment, which is good. You know. Yeah. So I also got to find out about a lot about their research areas too. Okay. So do you accept the students from overseas? I'm sorry. From what? Overseas from the different parts of the world, like other than Brazil. Well, the problem with the, with that is that we don't have studentships for foreign students in Brazil. It's very difficult to, to get one. Uh, if they come with their own uh, with their mm -hmm. own money, okay. with their stipend, uh, we could, but it's uh, not so common. It's more common for postdocs. Okay. But uh, for PhD students, uh, we don't have so many foreign students. Uh, sometimes from uh, there are some programs that will help you to uh, spend some time in another country. So sometimes we do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, send our students to a, collab a foreign collaborator. And sometimes a foreign collaborator sends the students to us. But to do the whole uh, PhD or the whole master's degree, uh, in Brazil, if you're a foreigner, it's not so so easy. Unfortunately, um, we do get some Latin American students, but usually they come with the programs from their own countries. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting my invitation and unlocking your interdisciplinary studies in on this show. It was a pleasure for me. Thanks very much. And if you ever want to invite me again, I'm I'm free to participate. I'll be happy to, sir. Thank you.